Most women are dismissed, neglected, misunderstood in the hands of medical professionals. I do not believe in a label of incurable or untreatable. And I know so much of our medical space is doing not only disservice, but psycho-emotionally harming our pelvic pain, um, women, women with pelvic pain, because they are not giving them any answers. This is Awakened Love, the podcast, and I'm your host, Angel. This is a space where we get real, real about sex, love, and awakening. So strap in, let's go deep. What's up, beautiful awakened beings? Welcome to another episode of Awakened Love. On this week's episode, we have Dagma Khan, who is the founder of the Flourish Institute, a women's pelvic health and business development company that is sparking a revolution in trauma-informed pelvic healthcare. So if you've ever had painful periods, painful sex, any pain in the pelvic area, then this is for you. Or if you're just curious about a trauma-informed approach to somatic healing and somatic release in the body, then this episode is for you. Enjoy. Welcome to the show, Dagmar. Thank you for being here. Angel, it's such an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So it's such an important topic that you work with and that I want to get into today, but can we just start with the basics for everybody listening around what is endometriosis? What is pelvic pain? Does pelvic pain always, is it always connected to endometriosis? Why is it important that we know about this? Take us, take us from the beginning. Yeah, I would absolutely love to because it's a topic that I'm extremely passionate about. And I really believe um, doing this work for close to 20 years, that pelvic pain population is one of the most underserved population on the planet, period, full stop. So Mm. pelvic pain, like if you look at it a little bit like through the biological lenses, and I hope I can go with your listeners there, like a mini anatomy lesson, uh, pelvis is obviously uh, everything from the bottom of the gut all the way down to uh, the hips. And uh, pelvic pain is really broad name. Pelvic pain can be a pain in any part of the pelvis, whether it's like a sacrum, whether it's like the left side of the pelvis, the right side of the pelvis. Uh, under to, under the term of pelvic pain, we are of course seeing things like vaginismus and vulvodynia and pain with intimacy. Uh, period. Can we pain. slow down with those terms just for anyone who doesn't know what yeah. vag, uh, vulvodynia or vagin? What was it? Vagin, vaginismus. <laughs> vaginismus. Vaginismus so, or vulvodynia. So, what do those mean? Uh, vulvodynia and vaginismus are pain in the bum bum or pain in the pelvic floor, shall we say, that make Mm -hmm. intercourse and sexual intimacy uh, either very uncomfortable in the best cases, all the way to downright impossible in the worst cases. And vaginismus is ultimately extreme tension in the pelvic floor. And vulvodynia symptoms are tension Mm. in the pelvic floor, but also itching, burning, spasms, Sometimes even pain mm-hmm. when a woman has orgasm, which of course should be like the most beautiful experience on the planet, except is not for so many women with vulvodynia. Mm. Oh, wow. I had no idea. It's is that like every now and then, and it's usually around my my period, I'll get like a shooting pain. <laughs> and I remember I did a workshop with you Um a couple of years ago and you were describing this and I don't know if anyone listening gets this, like whether they have vulvodynia or the other things you're describing or whether it's more just something like every now and then you'll get like a shooting pain in your vagina and you're like, Lord almighty, like cramping intense. And then it just goes away. Like mm-hmm. what's up with that? <laughs> oh, that can be a Is lot that, of- Where like, does that come from? Tell us. Th- there can be a lot of spectrum <laughs> on that. You know, this can be very related to where you are in your cycle. Mm-hmm. Uh, this can be uh, my sense is that like yeah. you don't have vaginism or vulvodynia, but with vulvodynia, this is really really common. Yeah. And sometimes with things like STDs right. or you know uh, ba- uh, bacterial vaginitis, uh, the spasms can be there. But usually, like if mm-hmm. a pelvic pain 
is not an ongoing issue. This can be very related to really where you are in your cycle and some sort of hormone fluctuation. It can also be related to just like a moment. You know, mm-hmm. one of the things I like to always say to our students and clients is that we all have bodies blind spots. We every single one of us has bodies blind spots, and mm-hmm. that's where tissues are either overused, underused misused, abused, Mm -hmm. or plain downright Mm -hmm. confused. And these blind spots (laughs) over time lead to pain and injury scenarios that no one wants to have on their health list. So tying it back to, you know, occasional, Mm. let's say spasms in the vagina, some people carry like stresses and tensions of their lives on their shoulders, extremely common. Some people get it in their lower backs. Mm -hmm. Some people, some women with chronic pelvic Mm -hmm. pain, and I'm not trying to be dismissive here, just kind of like a raise awareness. They can get it in their pelvic floor. They can get it inside of their pelvis. Mm. And that's how... So we are carrying potentially stress in our pussies. You couldn't say it any better. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) <laughs> I'm like, honey, my pussy gets stressed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes sense, right? Like people get tension headaches. That I mean, that makes sense to me. You get a migraine from yeah. chronic stress. You could, I mean, and also does ab- abuse and trauma um, play a factor here? I'm a play sexual a trauma survivor trauma. and I know there's been a lot of work. Yeah, say more to that. Yeah, I'm so sorry to hear that. And... Yes, sexual mm, abuse, okay. sexual assault, incest, rape play a huge role in unresolved and chronic pelvic pain, which is why I believe in mm. order to like really get down to um, the root of pelvic pain and help women transform this often debilitating um, impact the way it has on the quality of their life, the way it has on the quality of their intimate relationships. Um, we need to be doing uh, really, ideally we are working with a trauma-informed practitioner, but we need to be fostering resolution of the trauma in the pelvis and in the gynecological and reproductive system. Mm. It's essentially important. Mm. What does that look like, that fostering this resolution of the trauma in the pelvis? Mm, I love this question. someone's listening and they're like, whoa. Yeah, I Mm. like this question. So um, over the years and over the decades, working with thousands and thousands of women around the world, one of the critical missing piece I have seen is when women have experienced sexual abuse or sexual assault, they ultimately are not feeling safe in their pelvis. And there might be in like ideology, mm. there might be, you know, like with their mind, they might think, oh, look, I'm, I'm safe. Like I, have, I don't have any problem. I'm totally safe. But when we actually start to do tissue work, we actually start going into this part of the body and uh, maybe applying a self-massage strategies or pelvic floor release strategies and so on, we begin to see over and over again how much, in a best case scenario, unsafety is in the pelvic system and in the worst case scenario, like an utter sense of fear and terror. And that can be in all of the pelvis, that can be in some segments of the pelvis, um, going back to some of the conditions that we, that we're jamming on, like vaginismus, vulvodynia, women tend to have terror that literally sits at the entrance of the vagina. So aside of, you know, work that a, uh, that a woman might need to do with, um, a mental health professional or with psychologists, a work that might need to be done in the context of relationship and relating and safe relating, what's needed on the biological level is actually build safety in the pelvic system. And 
some of my favorite mm. tools, like, you know, this, this can be a, a beautiful concept, but it's like, you know, how, how does that happen? And how does it actually work? How do I create safety in my pelvis? Um, my favorite yes. tools for fostering safety are tools and practices that increase what's called proprioception and interoception, which is mm-hmm. ultimately like a s- innate mm-hmm. sense of your body, where you are in space in relationship to other body parts, and also mm-hmm. that innate sense of capacity to feel. And the way we do it in my world is through use of portable, pliable, grippy self-massage balls that women can literally put Mm. to the entrance of their vagina. They can put it into their uh, deep pelvic musculature. They can put it into their coccyx and sacrum, different parts of the pelvis to actually start locating and mapping their pelvis and through a very specific uh, techniques in uh, with the self massage tools, actually start eliminating the layers of fear and terror, and begin to create that nervous mm. system sense of safety. Yes, and I I can attest to this being um, very real, and. As you're speaking, what's interesting is I realized that I must have had undiagnosed when I was younger vulvodynia. That's the pain in the vagina that makes it difficult to have sex, right? Am I naming that correctly? It can, it can be vulvodynia. It can be dyspareunia. Yeah, yeah. But yes, some, as you're yeah. saying, some form of uh, intimacy. Yeah. Pain. Yes. And it was super interesting because I was, you know, in my, I was 18, 19, had a long-term boyfriend and would always get to the point where sex would just be so excruciating. And it was really frustrating. And I'm going to all of these doctors and they're saying nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong. And it wasn't until finally a GP um, said to me when I was on the table, she's like, um, relax. And I said, I am. And she said, oh, and sat me up and talked to me about trauma. No one had ever talked to me about anything like that. And she just said, look, it seems like you have um, an, an inability to relax the, the tension there. And sometimes that can come from trauma. And she's obviously just very intuitive. And um, she gave me some exercises to do in the shower, like to insert my fingers in my vagina and tap in each direction and breathe. And then also when I was having sex to, with my partner, exactly what you're saying, and I, I was only 19 at the time, just saying, I'm safe and, and I'm safe and I want this and I'm safe. And interestingly, after doing those exercises and really just after her shining the light of awareness on that, the, and then it went away and I never had that issue again. And then a few weeks ago, just for anyone listening, if you're like, you know, feeling like maybe you're suffering with this pain and, and obviously there's many different reasons for pain and trauma is just one of them. But I had a somatic worker working on my um, body got to my like lower kind of fallopian tube in my pelvis, hit this really painful spot and I wept and shook and had a full on somatic release from this point of tension that had been stored in my body. And exactly what you're talking about, I had terror stored in there. I was on that table, this is like two weeks ago, bawling my eyes out, making sounds I've never heard myself make and like whimpering and fear that I had to like discharge from my body in a safe space with a safe practitioner. And like, holy shit. I was like, damn, I've done a lot of work on healing. And of course there's always further to go, but I had no idea that it was hanging out in my fallopian tube. (laughs) Like, Is this something you see in the work that you do, these types of somatic releases related to these very specific points of tension? And if so, um, could you speak to what your understanding of that is? Yeah, I love what you're sharing. And firstly, God bless your GP. I mean, what a phenomenal woman. And I'm so glad that you actually came across a medical professional that was able to guide you to like really new perspective outside of like, there's nothing we can do for you and gave you something really simple to do. I heard a lot of that. (laughs) Yes. Yes, and that is unfortunately uh, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about the work we do is 
because most women are dismissed, neglected, misunderstood in the hands of medical professionals. But going to your questions, there's somatic releases we're seeing a lot, a lot with um, the self-massage work that we teach, with the self-massage practices that we teach that um, women are ultimately, the beauty of the self-massage work is that women are empowered to do this in the safety and comfort of their home. And that is, of course, value going to uh, a yeah. pelvic physio, to somatic practitioner, to people who can manipulate your organs and your viscera, all of that. But, you know, for some women, that's financially unaffordable. For some women, their practitioners can be like yep. way too far to travel. And there's also a level of a deep empowerment yep. that comes from in a similar way, like you knew what to do every single day in shower, right? Insert your fingers in the vagina and go after specific points. Mm-hmm. There's a level of empowerment that comes from women knowing what to do. And that in combination with somatic work and, you know, yeah. like a different releases in hands of a very good practitioner can be absolutely life-changing. Um, but back to your question, yes, we mm. see a lot of releases and a lot of discharges. Um, I was just uh, talking to a beloved client of ours literally yesterday and she was taking herself through a practice called pelvic floor release, but she basically takes a small ball mm-hmm. that uh, from like a massage therapy perspective, it represents a finger of, it represents a thumb of a massage therapist. And she was putting that in a very specific way on her perineum. The perineum is a very important part of the pelvic floor that's literally between the end of the vagina and the start of the anal sphincter. And for anyone who's like, oh my God, I would never put a ball up there. Firstly, believe me, the ball fits there perfectly. Second, this is mm-hmm. a point that women who are giving vaginal birth, they often get incision. They often get episiotomy. They get as a result of that mm. scar tissue. And that scar tissue is actually a huge contributor in pelvic pain. Massive. So she was doing this practice, Ooh, you know, a few days huh. in a row, four, five, six days. And she was telling me yesterday, Dagmar, the level of rage and grief that I was moving through doing this pelvic floor release, I had no mm. idea. Now she's 42. 42 years of her life, she had no idea she is that level of rage and grief sitting in her pelvic floor. But what it allowed her actually come in touch with this grief and rage, it allowed her to actually start processing some of the final remnants of her sexual abuse that she has experienced as a, as a young teenager. Mm -hmm. So that release, Mm. it can happen anywhere. Like it can happen whether you are doing a work with sacrum, whether you're doing work with hips, whether you're doing in your experience work with fallopian tubes, it can happen anywhere. Because back to what I was saying earlier, you know, we all have tissues in the body that are overused, underused, misused, abused, confused, right? And the touch, whether it's touched through yes. a self-massage tool, whether it's touched through very skilled uh, therapist hands, allows us to actually sensory perceive the experience, the sensations, Mm. the adhesions, the tissue quality that's there. And the touch, when it's done in a safe way and when your whole system is feeling safe, allows for this deeply held subconscious emotions to arise. And from there, the processing can unfold. And that is a huge, huge Mm. part of trauma resolution. Yes. Yeah. And as you were saying, to resolve the trauma in the the tissues of the pelvis, that physical, because what I realized through that experience was I've done a lot of even body-based healing work, somatic release being led, but not touch. And again, I've also done a lot of self-pleasure and I'm a tantric practitioner, but but this this idea of through touch, not just feeling, but through touch, like you're saying, whether it's self-massage or a really experienced practitioner, 
releasing the the energy that's stored there. It's like this tension holding the trauma or whatever it is for you that you don't even know is there. And you can do all the emotional work and the psychological work and even like, yes, come to some level of completion. But until you like physically, like physically get it out of the tissues, it's just hanging out there. It literally blew my mind. I was like, whoa, this is, this is wild. This is, yeah, it's so, so powerful. So can we talk a little bit about endometriosis? I mean, most women, I'm sure, unless you suffer from it, if you suffer from it, I'm sure you know all about what it is. Um, but f- for anyone listening, and maybe they are suffering from it and they don't know, what is endometriosis? Um, good question. Endometriosis is a plague that affects 10% of women in their reproductive years all around the globe. It's, wow, a it's a huge, lot. huge number. Damn. And, you know, in the medical space, endometriosis is kind of perceived and understood as a hormonal issue, which is why a lot of endometrial patients uh, step into contraceptive and hormonal replacement therapy. And, you know, eventually many are being rushed under surgeon scalpel with the final solution, which to me is not a solution called hysterectomy. And there is a lot to be said on that. But what we know from like really, really deep studies of endometrial patients, endometriosis can be a hormonal issue, but in most cases, endometriosis is actually immune disorder. Endometriosis is an immune disorder, which is why removing uterus, which is like, you know, you're removing organ that is ill, that's ill, or that's failing, or that is creating all these symptoms is not helpful. And the reason for that is because it's not going to take away the underlying inflammatory response. So... When people start, mm. when women start looking at, you know, uh, endometriosis solution, you always need to work on two levels. You always have to work at the level of biology and, you know, start addressing the immune system, which is very, it makes incredible difference, incredible difference to women's symptoms, to her quality of life, to the capacity to have sex that's not painful and subsequently there's work that has to be done on the level of psychology on the level of emotions because in any pelvic pain um, condition there are always psycho-emotional drivers I'm not gonna say causes but psycho-emotional drivers that either contribute to the condition or are keeping woman almost like hostage to the condition and her symptoms yes and that makes sense right because even the immune system we know is super connected to stress and we know that any um uh, adverse events in our childhood or any time in our life shrinks our window of tolerance for stress yes and then that's of course going to impact our immune system so that makes perfect sense to me as you say, that if even if it isn't the cause, it's going to be driving or contributing to in a huge way. Yes. Yes, unquestionably. And, yeah. you know, one of the, uh, this is kind of where we wanted to go with our podcast today. And that is like how all these pelvic pain conditions, how do they actually affect a woman in committed relationships uh, as it relates to quality of relating, mm-hmm. as it relates to sexual intimacy, as it relates to, you know, creating the happily ever after with their partners. And um, mm-hmm. this is a piece that's not being spoken enough about. Uh, I really feel in our space, we do speak and we do have a lot of awareness around um, kind of problems like a low sexual libido, low sexual desire, how do we address that and get partners to make love again. But we very little speak about 
you know, how pelvic pain and conditions like endometriosis or raging menopausal symptoms are actually making sex either painful or plain downright impossible. And it is uh, <sighs> almost like a taboo topic in our society. Very few people are speaking about it. It carries tremendous amount of shame for women, self-judgment in some cases, in some cases a lot of rage towards their own body, uh, often rage towards their own partner because, you know, if, um, and this can be triggering for some listeners, so I'm like creating creating the uh, condition around that because I definitely have been in those places myself. Um, I have actually... I am not someone who has struggled with endometriosis, but I am someone who went through a decade of infertility. 10 entire years, I was not mm. able to get pregnant. And my infertility came through a major trauma to my own reproductive system. When my very first son, I became mother when I was 18, and my first son, when he was four and I was 22, he got kidnapped. And I was brutally separated from my son for over 18 months. Now, it has been uh, oh my the Lord. most painful 18 months of my life. Uh, indescribable pain. Now, fortunately, due to, you know, hiring a good lawyers and involving um, the jurisdiction system, I was able to reunite with my son at that 18 months mark. It was the happiest day of my life. But what has happened from there, mm. I met man of my dreams. We are married, we have been, and now we are gonna about to celebrate our 18, 18 years anniversary in two weeks. So I'm very, very pleased. But there I was, thank you. Yeah. That I was, you know, with men of my dreams, we got married and we want to start family together. We both want to become parents. And I just could not. I could not get pregnant. I mean, I was, there was a desire inside of me to be mother again, but also to what we're speaking about before, an utter sense of terror utter sense of terror to be pregnant again, yeah. to make myself vulnerable, to be mother again. And all of that pain of losing my child can happen again. And it was really my own journey of healing, but also my this unsatiable hunger and desire to actually be mother that put me into this world and put me on a path of being a pelvic pain specialist. So with all of this being said, mm. and I know I have kind of sidetracked, so I don't know. <laughs> what we were, no, what it's we so were, beautiful. I'm so grateful you. you shared that story. I'm so I'm sure so many women listening can resonate and yeah, I want to hear um were you able to have an have a child again? Yes. At a 10 year smart back in 2017, yeah. I became pregnant. And in November 2017, I gave birth to my darling boy, Rumi. We have actually named mm -hmm. him after the Persian poet uh, because he is true messenger. And yes. Rumi is going to be six years old and he is the light of our lives, both for myself and my husband. Oh. Hmm. I'm so, so happy to hear that. And I'm sure there are many women, women listening that would love to know what were the things for you that helped you identify? Like, were you, were you aware immediately of that connection between the infertility and the trauma? How did you identify that? And what were the, the tools and the practices that supported you the most on your journey? Yeah, I love what you're asking. And I think coming in the sense of like the terror that's being carried in the reproductive system, like that alone is a process. I think back in, you know, now we have so, actually so much education, so much information about 
uh, trauma and impact of trauma. And uh, we have so many uh, somatic experiencing practitioners. There's a lot of trauma work that's really accessible to the public. But I think when I'm thinking like back 15 years ago, that, that wasn't a thing. Even like back 10 years ago, that wasn't a thing. So um, I think, yeah. you know, People yeah. nowadays have so much more access to, even if they are at the start of their journey, to maybe come across the information that helps them connect the dots. But that wasn't the case when I was at the start of my healing journey. So mm-hmm. I actually had to travel mm-hmm. um, all around the globe. And I have been studying with the titans in pain management and trauma therapy. I've put myself in a lot of classrooms, in a lot of teacher trainings, in a lot of workshops. And it was like, you know, one piece here and one piece of puzzle here and one piece of puzzle here and one piece of puzzle there. And a lot has been very beneficial, including doing actually a daily self-massage practice for my womb with... um, one of the therapy balls mm-hmm. and the process that we do, the process that we teach and like really fostering the environment of optimal circulation in the womb and the reproductive system. That was very, very helpful. However, my real breakthrough mm-hmm. did not really come until I started to resolve the stutter that was literally sitting in my womb. And that required a lot of mm-hmm. touch We have been looking at touch over and over again today, a lot of touch, a lot of Mm self-induced touch. And not only the touch, Mm. but actually allowing this absolutely heart-shattering grief to come to surface and allowing myself to fall apart in grief and then put myself back together so I can move through the day and take care of whatever I need to take care of. So it al- it, it really required me of, yeah. you know, building the courage also in my nervous system to be able to hold myself through these deep emotional releases. And I think yeah. for anyone who's listening, you know, this can be very scary territories. Like if I go in there, I'm going to just like fall apart. I won't be able to take it. Like, you know, everything that you're saying, it sounds great, but I can't do this. Here is what you can do. Yeah. I believe in creating a container of release for yourself. So it can look like, you know, whatever your mm-hmm. process is, whether some people are doing breath work or some people will be called to experiment with self-massage or massage, like whatever it is, you set up a timer for 15 minutes and you allow yourself to go ballistic. When the 15 minutes timer comes mm-hmm. to an end, you with compassion and self-love you know, do what you need to do, have a glass of water, give yourself a hug, maybe journal for a few minutes, but you really make that a transition. Okay, I have brought my grief process to an end. It's really helpful to wash your face and almost use that as like a ritualistic process. To, okay, yes. now I'm cleansed and I'm ready to slowly and sensitively mm-hmm. move into the rest of my day or rest of my night as incredibly, incredibly Mm -hmm. helpful to give yourself the permission to grieve or rage. It can, and sometimes Mm -hmm. dance of thought, right? In in, in one release session or multiple Mm -hmm. release sessions. Um, And at the same time, do it in a way that does not feel destructive or does not feel like, uh, I'm not able to step into that. Or if I start, I won't be able to stop. But on the contrary, doing mm-hmm. it in the tight, straight, and contained way so you can carry on with whatever you need to carry on and um, attend mm-hmm. to your partner, to your work, to your children, uh, whatever it is. And feel yes. good in the process. Yeah, it takes so much courage. 
Yeah, and it does. It does ultimately feel good, right? When we touch these core emotions, even though they're really uncomfortable, you know it's a core emotion because it feels good and it's moving you to a state of release. It's really those default emotions, those secondary impulses, those conditioned emotions layered on top of the primary emotions to keep those core emotions under wrap that are uncomfortable and have us spinning and staying dysregulated. But as you're saying, when you touch and it's very often, it's not always, but it's very often, as you're saying, rage, grief, shame. Yes. At the base of dysfunction, whether it's the physical dysfunction we're speaking about, whether it's the emotional, the psychological dysfunction that my work focuses on very often, and it's so beautiful you bring this forward, it's what I see as well as the basis is rage, unprocessed rage, unprocessed grief, unprocessed shame. Yeah. Because these feelings, is, as you said, it takes so much courage to feel them. When you said it was like you developed the courage to finally feel some of that grief and terror. When I was laying on that table the other day, I was thinking, Lord almighty, everything in me wants to stop this feeling and terror and put a cap on this. And it took all the courage that I have to just let it rip through me. It took every ounce of courage I have to do that. And it's like, I really want to honor you and honor everyone listening for their willingness to heal. And I know that they are willing to heal if they're here and listening to this podcast because it takes so much courage, as you're saying. <laughs> so speaking of that, how, how did you develop that courage to say, okay, I'm going to set the timer. I'm going to create the container. I'm going to go in. Because sometimes that's the hardest part. Like there is that fear as you're saying, like, what if I never stop? So like, that's the beautiful thing to assuage that fear, have that container. But what about the other people that think, I don't, I don't know if I can even go there. How do, how do they build that courage to touch that? Yeah, I love this so much. Uh, this comes up all the time. <laughs> the building, the courage to feel, which I personally believe for us as a woman is a superpower, is an absolute superpower. And there are things that can be done very much on a biological level to build that. And I'm specifically talking about Mm -hmm. uh, improving neurotransmitter balance. So taking specific supplements, like for example, L-theanin is incredibly helpful to um, kind of like really build a nervous system that the greater window of tolerance instead of shrinking, collapsing, falling apart. I did not know that. Yes, yeah, so a lot can be done from a neurotransmitter well, balance. Well, a little plug for my husband's company, L-theanine. <laughs> Just a quick plug for my husband's company. His coffee creamer has L-theanine in it. I had no idea that that's a benefit of it. And I have it every day in my autonomy. So plug for my husband, oh. as you were. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Back to the you neurotransmitters. So you can take vibe. L-theanine. <laughs> yes, yeah, so a lot can be done, of course. You know, I, we are not even talking basics like nutrition, you know, optimal sleep. Like optimal sleep alone can create so much resilience in the nervous system. But where we are seeing so many women are, you yep. know, playing downright exhausted. Insomnia is on rise, anxiety is on rise, waking up in the middle of the night is on the rise, or even sleeping through the night and then waking up like a zombie, like I need to hit another two hours. So there's a lot, lot, lot to be said, of course. And you know, I think the foundation has to be met, like you gotta sleep well. And if um Anyone listening is struggling with sleep. One of the greatest practices on the planet I can recommend for actually really deeply restoring nervous system, deeply building sense of rest and capacity is ancient practice of yoga nidra. Do you know of yoga nidra, Angel? Mm. Mm -hmm. Have you you ever experienced yoga nidra? I believe I have, but go on to explain and I can see yeah. if what I think I've experienced is in alignment with what you're about to share. Sure. So yoga nidra is a yogic form of sleep where basically same as at the end of mm-hmm. every yoga class, people do shavasana, they spend in it anywhere between two, five, seven minutes. Mm-hmm. Yoga nidra is done in shavasana but in very supportive Shavasana. So people can do yoga nidra literally lying in the bed with like pillows under their lower legs, Mm -hmm. blankets, so they're really warm and cozy. 
eye pillows over their eyes so they are experiencing mm-hmm. full darkness and the eye pillow is also very helpful for um, a stimulating vagus nerve which is the chief regulator of balancing the nervous system but ultimately with yoga nidra mm-hmm. you are addressing a three types of stresses the first type of stress is physical stress so yoga mm-hmm. nidra actually helps to unload buckets of tension from the physical body um the second type of stress it addresses mm-hmm. is a mental stress and all that anxiety mismatch chatter monkey mind everything that's happening in the mental sphere and the third type of stress addresses actually psycho-emotional stress. So it allows people in extreme state of relaxation, probably like the, the relaxation um, people might not ever experience before. It's just profound kekun of relaxation. It allows them to psychologically touch and come in contact with some of these deeply held emotions and actually process them and digest them in the yogic form of sleep. So what I love mm. about Yoga Nidra is they've done some amazing studies and like 30 minutes of Yoga Nidra biologically restores the body, same as four hours of biological sleep. 30 minutes of Yoga Nidra, same as four hours of biological wow. sleep. Like talk about time management and addressing exhaustion it's incredible yeah and all the mamas out there with newborns oh, get some yoga oh, nidra going on there <laughs> lifesaver for new mothers absolute lifesavers um even doing it like between the feeds around the clock all of that stuff but you know back to kind of the original question you will have more capacity to you know, have, have, have willingness or resilience or courage to attend to the unhealed when you feel restored, when you're not exhausted, when you're not like swinging yes. inside of fire and you're like, boom, 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 boom. It helps tremendously. Um, yeah. if, for those of yes. you that had an amazing massage experience in your life, like you might go into a bodybuilding experience like, you know, upset and really angry and, oh, my God, this and this is going on. And an hour later, you're like, what was all that fuss about? I have so much more perspective, right? <laughs> so get body work done. Do some I get massage. that with exercise. You get that with exercise? I did a really good workout. Awesome. Awesome. With exercise, yeah. I'm like, oh, my God, the world is ending. And then I do a really good workout. And afterwards, I'm like, what was I so upset about? (laughs) So, yes, yes, yes. With the Yoga Nidra, do you have a teacher that you love or would you just go onto YouTube? Like, what would you recommend if people are listening and like, I need some Yoga Nidra in my life? You definitely Yoga Nidra. I actually love there's a YouTube channel um, by a girl. Her name is Kristin Yoga. And she has... Anyway, mm-hmm. yoga nidra is anywhere between 30 minutes all the way up to one hour that are free. And they are incredible. Mm-hmm. Just incredible. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. What do you wish that more people knew about pelvic pain? Mm-hmm. If you could tell the world or the Tim Ferriss question, if you could put it on a billboard, what would you say? Pelvic pain is an invitation from the most sacred part of your body to come in deep touch with yourself. Pain is a whisper Mm. and it's an invitation for Mm. many to bring an end to the painful past, to become peaceful with what is and forge a new beginning. Mm. I do not believe in a Mm. label of incurable or untreatable. And I know so much of our medical space Mm. is doing not only disservice, but psycho-emotionally harming our pelvic pain, um, women, women with pelvic pain, because they are not giving them any answers unlike your own GP god bless her again Mm -hmm. she's amazing I wish I can hear more stories (laughs) like that yeah 
But the pelvic pain is really an invitation. I got lucky. You got extremely lucky. Uh, Pelvic pain is an invitation to take healing Mm. into your own hands. And um, in a lot of cases, that looks like, you know, finding the right mentor, the right guy, the right practitioner who can actually uh, bring you to what you need to know about yourself and about your body. But ultimately, healing is in your own Mm. hands. And when you do learn about your body, then you do acquire the tools and practices that facilitate the healing. But most importantly, very much to what we have been looking at, like when you foster the ovarian power to feel what needs to be felt and digest what has not been digested, you're truly sourcing healthcare, pelvic healthcare, gynecological healthcare inside of yourself. And it's the greatest source of freedom and the greatest source of pleasure because better orgasms, longer orgasms, more juicy orgasms are inevitable Mm. as a result. Mm. Yes, yes. And I mean, I'm living testimony to what you're saying. I... Um, I, I had abnormal paps and HPV. I struggled with that for years and doctors just told me over and over again, just wait, just wait, just wait. There's nothing you can do. Um, there's nothing to be done. And then it took me several years. And then finally I was like, surely I can do something about it. Started taking all the things you said, supplements, started really working on my immune system, started doing all of this, um, deep, deep healing work on my sexual trauma history and somatic release and therapy. And I healed and the doctors told me there was nothing to be done. And actually I have clear paps and cleared myself of HPV. So you know, if you're listening. That is incredible. Yes, I was so stoked. <laughs> I was so stoked because it's so disempowering when people tell you there's something wrong, but there's nothing you can do. Or worse, there's nothing wrong and there's nothing we can do. When you're like, there's definitely something wrong. If you're in pain, you know. So I just love this message, Dagmar, and I'm so grateful for the work that you do in the world. And if people are listening and, and they want to find more of your work, maybe they want to um, – Procure your services. How do people find you, get in touch with you and your work? Great question. So firstly, I have to say this because this is something that I just see as a reality. And that is we do not have enough women's pelvic practitioners in the world. The pelvic pain Mm. numbers are exponential and we do not have enough specialists who have the skills, the trauma-informed knowledge, the confidence, the mentorship to actually help women eliminate pain and source healthcare inside their bodies. So if you're someone who is Mm. in the healing world, who is in the coaching world, or maybe aspires to step into healing, I would love to invite you to check out our very free training called How to Become a Sought After Women's Health Specialist and confidently work with women's endometriosis, mm. pelvic pain, infertility, and menopausal symptoms. And you can find it, of course, in show notes. The link mm. is flourishwoman.com forward slash on demand. That's flourishwoman.com forward slash on demand. Now, that aside, I am... We'll have that link in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. That aside, I am, I have to be honest, I'm a Facebook girl. I'm not an Instagram girl. I'm trying to get my bum bum on Instagram, but I am really a Facebook (laughs) girl. And I'm also very much a (laughs) person's person. Uh, So you're very welcome to connect with me on Mm -hmm. Facebook. My handle is Dagmar Khan. You're very welcome to slide into my DMs and I will be very happy to chat. We have a variety of programs for the pelvic healing population that all the work can be done in the safety and mm-hmm. comfort of people's home and truly um, attain to that ovarian power and start sourcing the healing inside of them. So all of that is available for your listeners. Hell yeah. I love that sourcing healing inside of ourselves. I experienced it. 
it was phenomenal. I'm so grateful for the work you do. And I'm really grateful that all our listeners who maybe having some of these experiences now have a clear path forward or a resource and a, a, an expert that they can connect with or become one themselves by the sounds of things. So thank you so much, my love. I appreciate you and more soon. Angel, it's been true pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for today, Awakened One. And just a quick Thank you from me. Thank you for gifting us with your most precious resource, your time and attention so that we can make this world a more awakened place. And if we're not friends on Instagram yet, then we absolutely should be. So come on over and say hello at Angelica Alana and I'll see you there and see you next week.